Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us today. My name is Jay Singh, and I will be your host for this NASA Ames Technology Transfer Program webinar on the various aerospace technologies from NASA Ames Research Center. The webinar will be structured in a lightning talk format. The presenter will have 10 minutes to present their technologies and then five minutes for Q&A. Before we get started, I wanted to mention the Technology Transfer Program has over 1,000 patented technologies across the entire agency and 100 different technologies that AIMS available for the public to license. I'd also like to point out that your microphones will be muted throughout this presentation. So if you have any questions, please type them into the Q&A box and we will answer them during the Q&A session at the end of each presentation. At this point, I'm going to turn it over to our first presenter, Kapil. Good morning, everyone. Um, <clears throat> Uh, my name is Kapil Shef, and um, I'll be talking to you about uh, the technology called FACET. Uh, it's an acronym for Future ATM Concepts Evaluation Tool, ATM being air traffic management. Um, uh, for this technology, I'm going to talk about two technologies. For this technology, uh, the slides are kind of old because uh, we've taken this technology and we've added some functionality to it. So. I generally don't don't make presentations just on facet on its own. So, but with that, uh, let me get started. Um, uh, first of all, um, um, I'm just gonna tell you a little bit about uh, facet. Let's see if I can move. Okay, I can't do that. Whoops. Um, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, facet. Uh, uh, intro to the uh, ATM arena itself. Give you a little description on facet. Some of the facet applications and. Hopefully I'll show you an animation. Uh, I'm gonna try and fit everything in. This software has been in existence for almost 25 years now. So there's a lot of stuff that has uh, gone on with it. Um, if you're in the air traffic management arena, you sort of know this, but it's a, um, our system is um, almost at capacity while well, barring COVID right now, but otherwise, and especially during bad, we bad weather conditions, you know, there are significant delays in the system. Um, it's not very flexible or scalable, and it's uh, it's one of the most complex system, transportation systems in the world. Um, there have been several animations, you may have heard about it, uh, that, that have been made using the system. Um, and uh, Professor John Hansman of MIT, he has used these uh, testifying before Congress and GAO. So, um, this this tool has received a lot of uh, recognition along the way, and I'll talk about some of that. Um, so, what is FACET? Uh, you know, it models the national airspace system for both research and operational use. Um, it was in operational use uh, by the FAA traffic flow managers. Uh, it is being used for research right now, and um, it was used by airline dispatchers for weather rerouting. And the next technology I'll talk about, we'll, I'll uh, get into that a little bit more. Um, so let, let me move on to uh, a technical description. The core features are it has a user interface like the image that you saw earlier. Uh, it has a traffic and route analyzer as well as route parser and trajectory predictor. It takes in data, um, basically whatever is the source data, it, bas it just takes that in. So we read and rapid, rap uh, rapid refresh winds, uh, corridor integrated weather system or convective weather data. Uh, FAA traffic data, the tracks and flight plans. We have historical databases. Uh, it has aircraft performance data for climb, descent, cruise, and adaptation data for Air Force, air, airways, uh, uh, airspace, et cetera. And there are a whole bunch of applications, um, and I'll show you a couple of them for, for NASA use. Um, the, you know, it's, it's actually a good combination of uh, a balance of fidelity and flexibility uh, it can model all the aircraft in the national airspace system at the, at uh, every instant in time. And at the same time, you can do uh, uh, studies that, that run over days or weeks or months uh, if you wanted to. Uh, and, uh, you know, as uh, Professor Mark Hansen had said, uh, there really isn't um, another software which bridges this operational and research needs of the ATM community. Uh, in terms of applications, um, there are many, many applications that we have within FACET, but I'll just point out a couple of researchy uh, in terms of the advanced ATM concepts. Uh, one of them is the aggregate flow models uh, for traffic flow, as well as uh, performance metrics. 
Um, these are advanced techniques for clustering and data mining. Um, over 76 papers, these are just from the NASA team. Uh, papers have been uh, published in journals and conferences. Um, FACET got the 2006 Software of the Year Award. In 2009, we got the AIAA, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Aerospace Engineering Software um, of the Year Award. And in 2011, we got the FAA Excellence in Aviation Research Award. Um, from NASA uses, uh, one of the things that we did was to look at nominal mission operations for space launch vehicles. So you can model, uh, you know, different uh, uh, space vehicles like uh, the space shuttle, as well as some of the uh, newer models that were there being tested out early on. So you can look at those as well as off nominal operations where, you know, if there is some sort of an event, then what's the debris field um, and you can design hazard areas, et cetera. So, you know, uh, this is one particular uh, application that we have uh, other than the uh, conventional air traffic uh, uh, applications that uh, I talked about. Uh, from the FAA perspective, the main use was to do what if decision support kind of capability. Um, if you're aware of the air traffic control system command center, the software was running in there, uh, one of the labs, lab A. Uh, where they were doing these kind of studies uh, with uh, FACET. And um, the reroute conformance monitoring functionality, which is available within the uh, their operational infrastructure, um, was uh, something that came out from uh, within FACET, uh, was first developed within FACET and tested out. Um, and, you know, quite a few concept uh, uh, development and prototyping has been done, uh, especially with the AFP, which was deployed in 2006. Um, so, you know, the FAA has used it, uh, the airlines, this is an older use case, but, um, the, you know, the, the airlines typically, they, they like to fly wind optimal routes and a lot of the studies that were done initially, they've gone into, uh, some of the airline operations and they've looked at, you know, what are the benefits that they can achieve from that. Um, flight Explorer was one of the company is one of the companies which had commercialized facet software in 2006 and their main purpose was to be able to see uh, which are the congested sectors because that's the functionality that's not available to the um, airlines uh, they can look at it on the faa website and uh, uh, faa portal but uh, flight explorer is uh, it was is one of the companies that had provided the sector congestion data onto their um, operational system so here's an image from that um, and I'm going to take a couple of minutes to show the animation. Um, so I have the animation as well as the software running. Um, I think I'm just going to run the animation. But uh, before I leave you with that, uh, I'll mention that uh, there are four, um, four animations that were created that I created with uh, with FACET, which are running at uh, the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum. Um, they've been running since 2007 until about a couple of years ago because of COVID, they shut down the museum. So um, I'm aware of that they were running for at least 10, 12 years. Um, the Airline Dispatcher Federation also will uh, give us some awards and hear some comments from uh, uh, Flight Explorer as well as uh, one of the researchers using FACET currently. So with that, uh, let me show you the animation. Uh, I call it a day in the life of air traffic over the continental US. This is a newer animation I made uh, uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, the original animation, which was put up, uh, has actually over half a million, about 610 or 613,000 uh, hits on the on the animation. So I'm just going to play this uh, for you to see um, how the, um, you know, the data starts at, whoops, the data starts at uh, midnight Zulu, which is um, um, 8 p.m. Eastern and uh, uh, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, the weather is shown over here. This is like the CNN weather. This is corridor integrated weather system. You can see the hubs very clearly, uh, Seattle, Portland, San Jose, San Francisco, uh, Oakland, LA, Dallas, Fort Worth, Denver, so on and so forth. Um, as the weather moves and you're seeing all of these uh, red eye flights going off to Europe in the middle of the night. As uh, 
the traffic, uh, you know, sort of dies down in the middle of the night, uh, the number of aircraft drops down to like 800 or 900. Uh, this is data from 2016, March 2016. Um, you see some of the FedEx flights take off early in the morning, same with UPS. And as morning happens, uh, you know, uh, these East Coast uh, or the Eastern time airports uh, kick in, uh, the West uh, airports are still sleeping. Um, and you can also see the special use airspaces that pop up uh, as a function of time. So FACET is able to take in those, plus even the dynamic sectorization. So if any sectors are changing their shape, et cetera, all of those can be seen as well. Um, anyway, uh, this is just uh, just an animation uh, for, for, for of actual tracks of data uh, that particular day. And you can do this for any day. And many animations have been created by us as well as other people. So um, with that, I'm going to stop because it's 11.16. Uh, and I'm just going to say if there are one or two questions, then I'll be more than happy to answer those before uh, we go on to the next one. Yeah, um, that was uh, very interesting. Thank you, Kapil. So we have one question. Um, it's uh, asking about applications for researching the integration with AAM and UAM concepts. Is that something that uh, this can yeah, be used for? Certain. Yeah, certainly. Uh, in fact, uh, for the past two years, I have been uh, working on uh, on implementing drone models into the software. And we have developed technology called VAMOS, which is a Vertiport Assessment and Mobility Operations System. And in that, uh, actually, I have uh, three partners across the country, uh, three different um, uh, departments of transportation, as well as local communities, actually four. And uh, so I have created animations. Once they establish the places, Vertiports, which are sort of like airports, where these vehicles can take off and land. So once you establish those, I have created animation, I've created simulations of these vehicles going back and forth, including some battery usage as well as uh, uh, noise data, uh, if the noise modeling is is available. And we've done some using ADT, if you're aware of what ADT is. So yes, uh, it's possible to do, and uh, I'm not running the system, but if we set up a separate time, I can show it to you. Sounds great. Um, and then uh, one last question for uh, this technology. Is there is this software available to US companies? Uh, yes, it is. It has been commercialized by Flight Explorer. And uh, recently it was commercialized by, and I'll talk about that in the second technology. Uh, so Nascent, which is the second technology I'm going to talk about, that is an application built within FACET. And so whenever you uh, license Nascent, you get FACET as well. Uh, like, like you license FACET as well, because uh, without the capabilities and infrastructure of FACET, you could not run Nason. So yes, it is available. Long answer to your question, sorry. <laughs> yeah, no worries, I appreciate it, thank you. Um, yeah, I think that's, uh, that's all for questions for, um, for this technology. Uh, and my email address is kapil.shath at nasa.gov, so if you have any questions, you're more than welcome to. Uh, let me contact me. Okay, um, so the next technology I'm gonna talk about is uh, is what I call as uh, uh, NASINT, or uh, which is an acronym for National Airspace System Constraint Evaluation and Notification Tool. Uh, this is an application which is uh, available within FACET and um, uh, I should mention that the software won uh, Government Invention of the Year Award this year. So about four or five months ago, it won the Government Invention of the Year Award. Um, so moving on again, the outline, I'll, uh, I'll provide the motivation for this uh, description of how Nascent works, the Nascent innovation and creativity, some of the benefits and operational system and I'll, I'll, I'll try to do a demo at the end. So again, uh, you know, sort of uh, similar ideas. Uh, there are significant delays uh, in the NAS uh, when you have uh, severe weather and uh, the command center tends to put these uh, 
uh, the, these playbook routes, uh, if, if you were aware of the air traffic management system, that's one of the traffic management initiative that the command center puts in. If you have weather in the middle of the country, then they'll reroute aircraft all to the north of the weather or south of the weather like that. Um, so, you know, if I want to say, you know, very briefly what uh, nascent technology is, uh, nascent is a system which continuously searches for time and fuel saving, saving opportunities. So this is this technology is gear, geared quite a bit towards operational use within the airlines. So um, this this was the display that we had running at American Airlines, and I'll get into this uh, image a little bit uh, um, in a minute. So how does how does the system work? So if you have an aircraft which is located somewhere over here, uh, and this is a flight plan, uh, the currently active flight plan, what we do is we try to find a downstream uh, meter fix on the flight plan itself. And we see if you can go direct from uh, just a little bit ahead of the aircraft to that downstream fi fix direct. So you could save a certain amount of flying time savings. Now, if that route is crossing weather, then we introduce um, uh, an additional waypoint which uh, avoids the weather, but then you have to introduce these um, auxiliary waypoints because uh, uh, these auxiliary waypoints, because uh, uh, you know the aircraft uh, can fly these uh, named waypoints only. So, um, so that's how uh, a, a new flight plan is created, and so uh, from <laughs> from a what, why uh, why is it that uh, the advisories that come out from nascent are, are acceptable to the air traffic controller? Uh, that's because uh, we understand uh, um, and model the air traffic controller behavior within the system. And in some sense, if I <laughs> if I can say uh, nascent is an air traffic controller whisperer because we come up with advisories which uh, the uh, air traffic controller has already seen and. Uh, it takes very little to approve them unless there is a conflict of some sort. So here's the display that I talked about earlier. Uh, if your aircraft is located over here, um, then it has its current flight plan as this green route. Then what it does is it looks at the limit polygon, which is uh, one of the inventions of this technology, is uh, we call it as the controller polygon, which, uh, which is the polygon within which the controller will send the aircraft direct to a downstream fix. So in this case, the aircraft could be sent direct to this downstream, downstream fix called ELP or El Paso. And then uh, what Nissan does is it looks for the direct, direct route and tries to put it away from any weather that with a certain clearance. So this yellow route is the advice route, which is one uh, waypoint added San Antonio um, and takes uh, the aircraft to the uh, return capture fix El Paso with the rest of the route unchanged. And so the clearance is also very simple for the uh, pilot to convey to the controller. Uh, the sector congest congestion is shown over here as well along the original flight plan, which is this green route, and along the advice route, which is the yellow route. And you can see there's not much of a sector congestion difference. All of the flights that have these kinds of savings are shown over here. And this particular one is checked, which is the American 2435 for which the uh, analysis is being shown. All of the downstream fixes, and if you were to go direct, uh, you know what the savings would be are shown. The time savings, the fuel savings, the original route, the advice route, everything is shown. And if the aircraft is affected by some sort of a traffic management initiative, in this particular case, a playbook route, which is the level west partial, uh, that's also shown. So how do we create the controller polygon? Uh, we looked at eight months of data and we analyzed over a trillion data points with something, some string like this. And based on that, we plotted all of those points. These are all the points where just the Fort Worth center aircraft were sent direct to. Now, clearly, you know, Glasgow, Montana is not something that is going to be sent direct to during the day, but in the middle of the night, that could have been possible. So that's why it shows up. But then we really don't want to account for that. So what we did was we synthesized the data, took at, looked at the most frequently used fixes, and we came up with this uh, limit polygon or controller polygon. We showed it to Fort Worth Center, and uh, they said, "You know, this is you have really captured the behavior that we have." So, with that, uh, you know, we created limit polygons for all the uh, twenty centers in the United States, um, and so you know, 
this uh, nascent technology, it's a real-time and operational uh, game-changing technology in the NAS. Uh, it's not just for a local region for like just Fort Worth Center or Houston Center or LA Center. Uh, it maximizes controller acceptance of reroute advisory routes based on all of the uh, different uh, things that we have put in so that it becomes a controller, a traffic controller whisperer. <laughs> um, and since we can do this for one uh, flight, we can do this for multiple flights as well. And so the FA was interested in that uh, capability and uh, um, this technology was transferred to the FA uh, a year and a half ago, a couple of years ago. Uh, in terms of the benefits, uh, you know, just uh, on an average for 30 days, uh, we've got 15,000 flights that could save 135,000 minutes. And the impact was four, more than 4 million pounds of potential fuel savings. Comes to about 8.8 .8 minutes of potential savings uh, per flight, which is huge, uh, especially, uh, you know, in times like uh, today. Um, in terms of environmental impact, we found that uh, there's a reduction of about 8% in environmental emissions during the use at uh, American Airlines, early use at American Airlines. Uh, it's an operational system. It was uh, running live at American Airlines, and we've got statistics on the kinds of savings uh, they got. Uh, at the same time, it was also running on one of the projects I was managing at Alaska Airlines for a system that we were developing. Um, and uh, you know what's better than uh, yourself being in the cockpit and trying out the technology? So I flew on in April 2018 on one of the San Francisco to Fort Lauderdale flights, and I was connected to uh, Nation and got this advisory, which uh, could save uh, 180 pounds of fuel. So I suggested that to the pilot and the captain and. Uh, he requested clearance and in less than four minutes, we were able to get the clearance and the captain was able to save 180 pounds of fuel. Um, so we know it worked. <laughs> um, so the significant public and airline benefit is a revolutionary technology. And uh, as I mentioned, this is uh, um, commercially licensed earlier by Flight Explorer and recently by Root Dynamics Corporation. And there are evaluation licenses uh, that have been signed by a couple of other companies as well. So with that, uh, I will, I'll leave it at that and uh, show you the software. Let me turn on the application for nascent. Um, and, you know, while uh, this thing is going on, I can answer any questions because I don't want to take up uh, any more time uh, uh, for the following presenters. Yeah, thank you. This, um, again, very, very cool. Uh, so one question we have is, can both these software technologies be used to plan out feasibility of eVTOL integration into communities? Yeah, so uh, the first one, definitely yes. The second one, the way we have... Uh, um, this nascent technology, the way we have structured it, it takes uh, wind data. Um, you can you can probably see a little bit of probably not um, uh, the wind vectors uh, at various altitudes and uh, um, convective weather. But when you are talking about uh, UAM and AAM flights, they're in much smaller regions, so you need to have better wind data. Um, most of the UAM flights that you have would probably fall. Uh, within the resolution of uh, two or three, maybe, um, wind vector data points. So, because their range is uh, somewhat smaller. So, um, basically, you know, uh, you need to have uh, better wind resolution as well as uh, um, um, the weather. Like, you know, if you have, you know, rain or something else in the vicinity of a urban area, uh, then you need to have better definition of that for the system to be able to do, to be able to uh, take into account uh, those those factors as an impact on the flight of those UAM, AM vehicles. Um, as I said, you know, I'm willing to discuss uh, uh, that aspect with whoever is interested a little later. 15 minutes is just not enough time to do justice to, to any of this, uh, so. 
Um, any other questions? I uh, know that's um, that's all. Oh, actually, no. Uh, we got one last last one, last minute one. Um, of course. I don't know if you can answer this or not, but how how has the FAA proceeded to accept these technologies as standards for the future timeline? Um, for the future, and what would the timeline would that be like if they did do that? So two things. Um, um, as far as um, FACET is concerned, a uh, couple of technologies, the reroute conformance monitoring has already been accepted. Uh, it is there if you uh, look at the TSD, the traffic situation display at any of the centers at uh, FAA facilities, you see that capability available over there. Um, the airspace flow, flow, flow programs, there was a lot of modeling that was done initially over here. Um, the concept was developed within the collaborative decision-making group. Um, currently, the uh, FAA is using FACET for doing uh, some assessments and uh, for the 2035 concept that they are preparing. Um, also to do some of the water kind of uh, assessments and they've used nascent for that by creating a limit polygon, which I create, which I help them with for the whole NAS simultaneously. So, you know, it just doesn't have to be center based, but it's a NAS based solution now. And the multi-flight capability has been uh, given to the FAA. Uh, it is it was slated to be a part of their uh, uh, what was that work package five, and uh, because of other things that's on hold right now because the FAA is going through the release uh, seven or eleven for the TST, and so I don't remember the number. I'm sorry, uh, but so. Once that is done, then they'll put all of these technologies back in the list and uh, they'll see. So I don't know what the timeline for that is. Yeah, that was great. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Um, okay, yeah, Gilbert, uh, go ahead when you're ready. Hi. Uh, hi, everyone. My name is Gilbert Wu. I'm a researcher at NASA Ames. Um, the technology I will share with you is entitled Optimum Strategies for Selecting Descent Flight Path Angles. Uh, next slide. So this technology was developed uh, a few years ago. Um, here's the motivations. Um, we, there's a lot of effort uh, uh, by NASA researchers and also the uh, people in the operations to achieve efficient and safe arrival operations, uh, especially under uh, challenging traffic conditions. It could be uh, due to congestion or due to um, uh, like uh, capacity limits. Um, and in so NASA has done a lot of research in uh, in the two. Uh, in the area of improvement to uh, arrival operations. Uh, in working with uh, people in the field, we, uh, we understood that the trajectory predictability uh, has been one of the big issues uh, that prevent uh, ATC from allowing continuous descent approach. Um, so for this technology, we we propose an arrival procedure with a fixed flight path angle uh, or a fixed, uh, say, descent speed. Um, uh, we believe uh, such a procedure provides high trajectory predictability for management and can potentially increase uh, the throughput of the arrival operations. Um, this procedure is uh, very flyable by a lot of uh, 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 avionics on the on the commercial jets today, uh, almost all small jets. Uh, here, I, when I say small jets, I refer to the regional business and light jets. Almost all small jets support uh, such a procedure, uh, fixed flight path angle or fixed descent rate. And uh, at the time we uh, did this work, we were aware that. Uh, uh, a number of large jets uh, also had avionics uh, that support such procedures. And it has been a few years, so my knowledge may be a bit outdated. So the, the picture on the right side shows uh, the, uh, the tracks of 
uh, a number of small jet arrivals uh, into Dallas Fort Worth Airport in Texas. Um, so this is a four corner kind of a arrival uh, pattern that some of you may be quite familiar with. Next. So the technology is essentially a computation engine that takes input and uh, computes a, uh, uh, that selects a, a suitable um, descent profile uh, for the, the arrival procedure. Uh, so the descent profile, uh, so we focus on the portion of the arrival procedure um, uh, before, from before the top of descent to the metering fix uh, for large airports. Uh, but it could be easily extended to, um, uh, to the touchdown portion. Um, the selected descent profile can be for one flight or for a group of arrival flights um, into the same uh, following, uh, flying the same uh, arrival procedure or uh, with or a group of flights uh, within the time window. Uh, we have uh, we have investigated and proposed three selection strategies. The first strategy achieves the uh, the most benefit, which is a minimum fuel uh, descent profile. Um, but this uh, requires communication of the profile with the with air traffic control in real time. Um, the second and third uh, are uh, less uh, efficient than the, the first strategy, but are easier to uh, implement. The second one is called a descent speed based profile, and that is um, either either the preferred descent speed um, was known to air traffic controllers and, and the, the air traffic controllers can um, uh, issue, a, 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 a issue a descent profile accordingly, uh, making the flight path angle a function of the descent speed. Um, <clears throat> uh, or in the, in the, for the case of the third strategy, it's just the same uh, fixed flight path angle for all arrival flights. So the key input data to this computation engine uh, are the following. We, we take airlines preferred speeds for, um, for each flight. Uh, we need the, the aircraft performance data, uh, preferably the uh, kinetic model, but a kinematic may work as well. Uh, so we take the performance data and the, the predicted prevailing wind uh, uh, that covers the, the arrival procedure. And, uh, and certainly we need the, the procedure's information itself, such in terms of arrival direction or, or to be more specific, the route itself. Uh, and the computation engine will return a descent profile in the form of a, a fixed flight path angle or, uh, or a fixed descent rate. Uh, next. So this is just a, a high level uh, description of the computation engine. Uh, if, you're, if any of you is interested in application of this tool, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, the application uh, of this tool uh, from what we can see are the following. Uh, it could be, uh, it could benefit airline operations and it, and it could also um, aid the air traffic management uh, people. Um, specific benefits we, uh, we can see are the following. For the airlines, uh, such a, a descent profile is supported by small jets uh, kinematic flight management systems. So we're not, uh, we're not proposing an idle thrust uh, descent profile that may, uh, may not be uh, available to uh, small jets. Uh, we're, um, so that's, that's one um, 
that's one benefit. It's uh, it's uh, fireable by by a lot of jets, and uh, we believe the computation engine uh, uh, selection can help reduce uh, operational costs uh, for these flights with improved uh, arrival trajectory efficiencies uh, for the airlines. And uh, for air traffic management, this computation engine can help uh, design a, a, an arrival procedure that achieves better efficiency uh, with improved trajectory predictability. Um, uh, you can expect the top of descent uh, to be very predictable with this kind of a descent uh, profile. And, and again, um, since this, uh, this uh, descent profile is fireable by small jets, uh, it won't leave them out um, uh, and, and cause uh, like management problems for uh, air traffic control. Um, so that's all I have uh, for this presentation. Uh, I'm, I welcome any questions. Thank you, Gilbert. That was great. Uh, let me see um, what we have for questions here. So uh, one of the questions is uh, is about adaptability. So um, the adaptability to help understand urban air mobility and approach glide scopes between three and thirteen degrees, um, rather than fuel savings, the energy savings of the battery system will be important uh, to determine operational limits on a full battery. Uh, with various approach angles and hover time. Do you have anything uh, to comment on that? Um, sure. So when we uh, developed this technologies, we had conventional uh, operations in mind, uh, but certainly the same concept can be applied to the analysis of an optimal uh, descent profile for, um, for urban air mobility flights. Um, the um, the key input data uh, needed for this analysis is definitely the, a, say, a battery model. Uh, and, and also, uh, we need a, a finer grained uh, wind model, which is something that Capillo pointed out in his present, during, during his presentation. Uh, but I don't see any problem uh, uh, applying the same analysis to uh, urban air mobility flights uh, uh, with this approach. Sounds good. I appreciate it. Um, and yeah, that was the uh, last questions for that. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, and next up, uh, we have uh, Richard Monford. Good. Okay. Well, thank you um, for the opportunity to uh, talk about our Flight Awareness Collaboration Tool. I'm Richard Mogford at NASA, and uh, Dan Pecknick worked with me on this and designed the user interface. So, uh, some years, a few years ago now, we were asked by one of our projects to look into how to help airline dispatchers with the uh, winter weather. And uh, many of us have been in the predicament of being somewhere, and the uh, aircraft, sorry, the airport closes down, or the, the aircraft gets diverted because of winter storms coming through. And, and needless to say, it creates uh, orderly havoc in the system because there have to be the dispatchers uh, have to delay flights or um, cancel flights, and this is this becomes unpopular, of course, with uh, the people who want to get from A to B. So I'll talk a little bit what, about what the dispatcher does and about this tool. So the idea we uh, after talking with dispatchers was to bring all the information the dispatcher needs to manage the winter weather onto one screen. Typically, they they have uh, several software applications they use and a lot of uh, internet uh, bookmarks so that they can look information up that they need, but it's kind of scattered around. So this also supports collaboration, uh, has a messaging system, it's a web-based application, and it has various kinds of uh, data, including weather data from the FAA, system-wide information management system, or SWIM, runway closures, and so on, various uh, airport uh, types of information. I'm going to move along fairly quickly now. So here's an airline dispatcher's workstation. This is, uh, so there's sometimes more screens, but they typically have a map type display where they, they uh, can 
track the flights they're working. They have a timeline display, which might is like the one in the center to uh, look at the different flights that they're assigned to, to manage and uh, various other information on this other screen. So the dispatcher not only plans the flight, but they monitor the flight all during its uh, all during its course of travel and and to help help the pilot deal with things like diversions, FAA actions that might uh, delay the flight and so on. So they're very active in helping the pilot to manage the flight. Now it's not often the dispatcher's role isn't often talked about uh, in aviation. It's mostly the controller and pilot. The dispatcher plays a, a key part in it. The uh, software we designed or Dan design, we decided to have something that would not re, you know require another screen, but would sit in the background and uh, uh, be ready to be used for winter weather. And he designed this quad display. The surface map of the airport chosen on the upper right, an information view with various data and a communication view for, for messaging uh, you know, team members. And the, there's a center uh, icon to zoom in on what you might want. The, uh, I won't risk read through this whole list, but we got a catalog of data that or information that the dispatcher said they needed. You know, of course, air, the aircraft targets and uh, pilot reports, there's some abbreviations down the lower right spelled out, uh, various radar data, um, uh, FAA, NOTAMs, de-icing areas, that, and information about the airport, like the de-icing areas, the runway closure status, and so on. So we collected all this and put it into this quad display. Now, what's uh, interesting or important about FACT is that it accesses these data from various sources and filters them so that the dispatcher doesn't have to weed through all of the NOTAMs or all the information for various airports. They, they're, they're, they're given the information for the airport that they're interested in at a particular time. And as you can tell from what I'm saying, that not only the you know, upper level weather and so on, but the airport weather is very critical here. If the storm rolls through and starts uh, dumping snow on the runways, the airports slow down and then close. And that's something the dispatcher has to stay right on top of, especially if they're inbound aircraft. So here's how the display works. It's, it's, the display panes are linked. So if I'm looking at the upper left uh, screen and I click, let's say Denver, or that, I guess this is SFO actually, click SFO. Um, so yeah, of course you can see the traffic on the big map. So you can you can pick out your you know filter for just your aircraft, your airline's aircraft. So if you click on SFO, it brings up the airport and the traffic on the on the surface. Uh, it also pulls data up for that airport uh, that is cur currently like FAA data uh, that might be useful would be useful to know. Now in the lower right, there's a messaging screen that I'll go into in, in a minute. So the upper left is the uh, the big display. You know, it's, the, it's a situation display of the traffic, which, and then you can uh, there are drop down or drop drop down menus or layers where you can pull up various. Uh, uh, so like I think this is de-icing. This is oh, not de-icing zones where icing is occurring. So you can pull up various kinds of weather information that is useful to you, for you to look on a large scale. Then, uh, like I said, once you clicked on an airport, that opens up, and there are various information. There's various information there such as um, which runways are in operation, which runways are closed, the, uh, the braking action and, and, and other kinds of data, the de-icing areas, there are other kinds of data that the dispatcher would want to know. And again, you know, this information is available from other sources piecemeal, but we brought it all together on one display to show the, the dispatcher everything they need. Um, this is the lower left that just gives some examples of uh, information from the FAA advisories and NOTAMs and so on. And then on the lower right, we had a, a, a actually two communication devices. There's something where I can put, put a flag on the one of the maps to highlight something. And then I can also message my team. So I might have other dispatchers uh, in my airline operation uh, operators, people at the airport, at the ramps, at the icing operators, maybe some uh, contact with the FAA. Uh, the airport's actually the one who decides to close down the runways, not the FAA. So obviously, I want to be talking with them pretty, pretty constantly when uh, storms coming in. So this allows a, a within-team messaging system without having to send emails or pick up the phone. Uh, now, one thing we added to fact was so we started thinking of some automation that, that people had mentioned. So we had a we have an algorithm that takes a look at what's going on at the airport, for instance, measuring. Uh, taxi speeds is a good good way to sample 
example of how the airport's doing it, the taxi speeds slow down, slow down, and then pretty much stop, and the airport is locked down. So there's various ways you can check to see if an airport is starting to come to a standstill because of winter weather. Um, now, recently, we adapt, we're starting to adapt fact for urban air mobility, and here's the quad screen again, a little bit uh, different picture, but uh, giving, a, you know, the upper left a more, rather than the whole country, you know, a picture of the area of operation of the flight, a map at the upper right of its flight plan, and in this case, this uh, flight was, uh, uh, a change in the flight plan was made, you can see this UB720. At the bottom left are some optimization and timeline tools to show me what's going on with my flights. And uh, and then again, the and then some information and messaging at the lower right. This is not so much a winter weather tool, of course, but something there will be dispatchers with for UAM. Uh, they're going to need to to plan the flights and to monitor them. So we're starting to pre present some ideas about how the software might be designed to support them. Okay, so here we are. This is um, my last slide, I think. So the NASA patent was awarded. As we know, that's why that's why I'm here. One of the reasons that's available for licensing. Uh, we are now in the process of, uh, we had been using data, a data feed from NASA, uh, and we are now porting ourselves over to get to uh, get direct data from FAA. So we're, there's no interruption, the sort of changes that we'd have to account for so we can manage our own data, uh, data feeds. And as I said, we're developing fact for the uh, urban air mobility dispatcher. No, nothing in production yet, but we're uh, showing this to uh, some people in our project and industry to get some ideas and so they can get some ideas about how this might work. Uh, that's it for me. If there's any questions, I'm ready. Yeah, thank you. That was um, very informative. And so we have one question so far. What yeah. is the specific reason why this technology has not been applied um, for large commercial aircraft? Or maybe that was well, we, before. Sorry. Yeah, we, we did go, I, yeah. Um, yeah, we did go work with the airlines uh, when we first got this done, and there was some interest. We we did transfer the technology to some contractors. Uh, then 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 COVID COVID came along, and the airlines became interested in other things. So I think it's a uh, couple of reasons there. We did we were just really thinking about it this week. Actually, we didn't have a, a clean data feed of our own. We we worked through the FAA work through the, uh, the NASA, one of the NASA projects. So we couldn't transfer it as a uh, complete package. We did have, we, we were gonna transfer the software and then the vendor, and then the user would need to set up their own data uh, access, which I think, you know, it was uh, probably a, a not, not an optimal way of um, transferring the technologies to, to, and we're trying to rectify that. So I think, I think that, I think it wasn't quite portable enough. And uh, then as we, as we, as I said, as we got more into um, uh, talking with the airlines, then uh, COVID came up and it just became a, a very low priority on, on the list of things to do. Yeah, sounds good. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, yeah, so uh, next up we have uh, PK. And uh, PK, I'll be uh, sharing your tops page. Okay, perfect. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Yeah, so some of my uh, here, the camera is not uh, working for, but hopefully you can all hear me. My name is uh, Parimal Kopardekar. I also go by PK. I'm going to share with you about unmanned aircraft system traffic management or UTM. Uh, this is an invention that's focused on enabling large-scale drone operations. So let me just walk you through some of the current status and uh, how we change the state of the art. If you look at the current air traffic management, it has 50,000 operations. One operation is arrival or departure. And at the time, there are 3,000, uh, sorry, 6,000 aircraft at peak. And already the air traffic control system is at its peak and overloaded primarily because of the workload that's involved by air traffic controllers. And the way it works is only air traffic controller has information about what's happening in the sky because they have the radar display that shows the position of the aircraft and the flight plans. So any change that pilot needs to do in 
for their aircraft, speed change, altitude change, heading change. They had to get permission from air traffic controller because only air traffic controller knows what else is out there and how close they are. That's called management by permission paradigm where controllers had to give a clearance or permission for every change. Now, fast forward it to drones, particularly small drones that will operate below 400 feet. The forecast for these drones by 2025 and, and, and actually even sooner than that is expected to be 3 million. Once the beyond visual line of sight rule gets into effect, there will be multi, multi million drones operating. So clearly this will not um, be supported by the current system that already is taxed because of the air traffic controllers workload. So we needed to basically develop a new way of operating these drones and enabling them in the sky in the, in the magnitude of millions rather than 50. 50,000 operations in a day. So the idea is to change the paradigm from management by permission to management by exception, or the, uh, the way we think about this is instead of giving clearance and approval for every change, you say, tell me what not to do and share the information about everything that's going on. That will allow the operators of the drone to while create their own flight plan, so to speak, file it, coordinate with other share and with other operators and create share and care environment, in which case they will be able to safely navigate through the constraints in the airspace by themselves. So that's the idea. So the main premise of unmanned aircraft system traffic management is the creation of the share and care environment through cooperative operations with intent of sharing construct with application protocol interfaces and ability to use third party services using service oriented architecture and management by exception parallel. We tested this concept um, through four technical capability levels. So using somewhat of a minimum viable product approach. First one was just the exchange of information among operators themselves. So operator uh, and the service supplier could be one and the same. In case of large companies like Amazon and Google, it is likely that will be the same. In other cases, the operators may try to use service providers, which would be third party. So we tested this concept of sharing information of trajectories with each other. Second, we went beyond visual line of sight using this cooperative management of traffic. Only drones in the third technical capability level we tested with drones and manned systems, which is interesting. We studied a lot of interesting considerations from effect of weather, winds, uh, low density of air like Reno, which is 5,000 feet. Um, so interesting things were uncovered in terms of uh, understanding the, the characteristics of the system, how close you can fly them because winds can move the drones around with updrafts and things like that, the battery life and uh, effect of temperatures on battery life and things like that. And then the last technical capability level, we tested them in the city environment, Reno and Corpus Christi. Uh, which was done for the first time ever that uh, tested in the city environment, the drones. So we learned how to actually enable these operations in the city environment where sometimes the GPS is not reliable, sometimes the communication is not reliable, making sure that the community of interest or uh, the localities, the businesses and people who live there will accept them. So lots of interesting lessons learned. As a result, this uh, technology has been accepted. The concept has been accepted by FIA, and they are already beginning to implement it through low altitude authorization and notification capability and parts of different rules, remote ID, beyond visual line of sight and such. It's also been harmonized at the global level with um, international civil aviation organization adopting it there have been standards uh, related to USS, USS, which is the unmanned aircraft system service supplier, 
the third party that provides services such as communication, flight planning, and such, and how they interact with each other. So standards have been written. Uh, and this uh, this uh, particular capability won a couple of awards. Uh, one um, uh, is called SAMIs, which is um, also referred to as uh, uh, Oscars for the Federal Workforce in the Innovation category and then Federal Invention of the Year Award uh, a couple of years ago. So we have been very ha happy with the, um, the way this technology and the research has evolved into operationalization uh, it's been one of the greatest examples of the fastest uh, research idea to implementation inside aeronautics uh, which has been an internationalization um, of the idea and the concept so it's been really great to see this uh, come to fruition inside united states as well as other countries japan has adopted it we have a couple of joint projects with japan uh, there's a JUTM, which is Japanese UTM, KUTM, which is Korean UTM. Europe has adopted it. Uh, they call it U space. Poland has adopted it. India has adopted many other countries, Singapore. So it's been really rewarding uh, to see how this technology is, um, has been adopted. But most importantly, the impact of this is really uh, important because this will enable um, multi-billion dollar drone industry to occur beyond visual line of sight and um, furthermore this that's also set the stage for modernization of other parts of the airspace system we are also experimenting this technology and a construct of cooperatives airspace management over sixty thousand feet we are also looking to expand this for uh, urban air mobility 4,000 feet and below, so, and then also for space traffic management, which will happen above Karman line. So lots of interesting offshoots came after this uh, initial technology demonstration and its acceptance. I'll stop here and allow you to ask any questions. Yeah, thank you, PK. That was uh, very interesting. Um, so we have one question. Um, do you happen to know when operating BVRLOS, what observed landing point accuracies using GPS are being seen? Is it inches, feet, yards, or um, of the planned touchdown position? Well, it depends on the uh, which GPS system or localization you use. But if the GPS obviously is not inches, is more than that. But you know somewhere between inches and, and feet uh, is, is what uh, we have seen. Um, uh, however, I will warn you, we have seen some GPS jamming occurring at many locations. So I'll just give you an example. We were doing testing of this uh, at Crow's Landing, which is a couple of hours from NASA Ames. Uh, and we were near I-5, which is the Highway 5. And what we saw was many times the truckers would go by and the GPS signal would be unreliable all of a sudden from instead of looking at 12 satellites and getting access to 12 satellites, we go to get access to one or two or three satellites. Mm -hmm. So I think our hypothesis there is that some truckers were using jammers and that uh, impacted the uh, accuracy. So there, it's completely possible that certain locations you might be more constrained with the GPS uh, GPS driven location information. Of course, there are solutions like uh, visual audio metry, uh, landmark based navigation, as well as beacon systems like NextNav and Locata that can triangulate your position. So there are a no number of ways you can still do that. Uh, but uh, that information really is situation specific, specific and roughly specific. Thanks, Siri. Oh, very interesting. Um, so uh, we have two more questions. Um, I'll answer both. I'll ask both right now. Uh, the first one is: Will transponder data regarding UAVs be available to GA um, pilots, and how does collision avoidance factor into UTM? Yeah, it's a great question. So the transponder data certainly is a, uh, UAVs will be required to use some kind of transponder, ADS-B, such. Uh, 
Um, it's also part of the remote ID rule. If you look at study the remote ID rule, you will see that they are uh, required to broadcast the the this specific information about the drone and the, and the operator of the drone. Uh, so that's definitely the case in GA pilots if they have ADSB. Um, in, you know, basically uh, access to ADSB, they will be able to uh, get information about uh, about the UAVs as well. So the second ask, but drones drones will be required to stay away from general pilots. So, so there are some aircraft that don't have radio or beacon and, and such, so they will have to basically navigate themselves. Um, so we assume um, that in class B airspace, there is no requirement for ADS-B for general aviation. So drones will have to navigate through that, obviously. Then in terms of collision avoidance factoring, yeah, there are a number of ways we are we experimented. One is the um, strategic deconfliction, which is the trajectories that US operator will create through either USS or themselves, the service supplier or themselves. And they go into the UTM, and that gets connected into the FIA system. And there is a discovery service that happens that allows you to share information about your trajectory to other operators and other operators to share with you. So that's the that's the strategic deconfliction. And the tactical deconfliction will require some kind of either through remote ID or through detect and avoid technologies. And now the detect and avoid technologies for small drones haven't been as reliable yet, and they are getting there, but um, there will be those two layers that will uh, be important for collision avoidance. And the last question I see here is, what types of integration is possible with US systems out in the market for UTM solutions uh, that has been validated? Uh, you, uh, what type of uh, integration is possible with US systems out there. So we have, uh, as, as I mentioned, we did UTM-4 technical capability level test. After that, FIE did UPP-1, unmanned aircraft system, traffic management pilot project one and pilot project two. We are also looking to expand that further so the idea is to enable use cases that primarily go beyond visual line of sight. So that would mean infrastructure uh, surveillance. We also tested infrastructure surveillance at NASA Ames property for wind tunnels through UTM integrated system. Uh, we're testing it for wildfire management. And, and then obviously we all know the use cases for agriculture deliveries and rooftop inspections, traffic monitoring, and many other, many others. So those are the things that we have tested uh, in our UPP, FIS UPP pilot project one and two, as well as NASA's uh, own tests. Oh. Um, thank you so much, PK. That was great. Uh, very informative. Uh, thank you for answering those questions. Um, and yeah, so that takes us to our next presenter, uh, John. Okay, so um, this is a little bit of a, a different talk um, versus airspace focused. We're talking about uh, uh, applications for motion based trajectories and maneuvering for unmanned systems. And these systems are currently being used a lot in applications like surveillance, where the vehicles can basically fly pre-programmed routes. And to a large extent, these are somewhat bounded problems, um, but as their roles expand to include things like tactical maneuvering, we expect that these systems are gonna need to incorporate more aspects of a pilot's experience, reasoning, and learning abilities. So one way of addressing this problem is by leveraging like pattern recognition, learning, and optimization cap uh, capabilities um, through the use of an artificial immune system. So we began originally by applying this approach to science-based applications involving relative positioning and pointing of payload sensors to non-stationary targets. And at some point we wanted to see how far we can take this. So 
eventually we wanted to see if we can apply this to something like uh, the challenge of air combat maneuvering, um, kind of like as a far end, which uh, is the example we're kind of showing today, um, just because it's one of the more challenging ones. Um, so I'm going to briefly talk about a biologic immune system, but this is very kind of basic high level. So please don't ask me questions about COVID because I'm not going to be able to answer those questions. Uh, but the, the immune system protects the body against intruders and it recognizes um, destroying harmful cells or molecules. So it can be thought of as a robust adaptive system that is capable of dealing with a variety of disturbances and uncertainties. Uh, it can also remember how previous encounters were successfully defeated, if you will. So as a result, um, it can respond quicker to similar encounters in the future, which is why we are using this approach um, for this application. So the immune system response uh, is driven by the introduction of a threat or uh, I don't know if you can see the mouse, but it, the, an antigen um, that invades the body. So the B cells, uh, there are B cells and the ones that can bind to those antigens become stimulated uh, by killer T cells. And they begin the process of mitosis and um, separating, splitting and mutation. So while this eventually leads to the production of plasma cells, which will generate the antibodies to nullify the antigens, the memory cells are also generated, which kind of keep the, the immune system from extinguishing itself once the anti antigen has been removed. So, so it kind of keeps those, the memory of those B cells uh, um, in memory for future access. The artificial immune system is, is basically an analogy of the, of the biologic immune system. And it contains a priori knowledge, uh, uh, I'm sorry, applies a priori knowledge uh, with adapting capabilities and through computational models that perform pattern recognition, learning and optimization. So in this case, we have the bone marrow models, which represent the B cells and the antibodies and negative selection helps uh, in this application to more or less manage the B cell population. The clonal selection algorithm um, represents the process of mitosis and mutation. And finally, the immune system network represents the memory cells, which in this case is um, uh, modeled in the form of a database, uh, which includes problem to solution mapping. Um, and just like uh, uh, vaccines, um, we can use training sets to build up this initial, this database initially. And that's one of the things that we did. So I'm not gonna go over this too detail, but at its core, the clonal selection algorithm really uses a combination of genetic algorithms and evolutionary programming to optimize the population um, to find the potential solution. In terms of uh, how we applied this to do what we're calling immunized maneuver selection, the aircraft, the intruder aircraft represents the antigen or the problem. The, that problem is characterized, I didn't mention it, but the um, antigen has uh, the epitopes which characterize that, that antigen or the connection to the antigen. And that's represented in this case in terms of relative positions and velocities of the intruder aircraft. The maneuvers, represent um, the antibodies or the solutions that that's produced and that will be executed by the vehicle. Um, they are initially constructed through basic flight maneuvers, which we'll uh, talk about more in a little bit. And the population is randomly uh, generated uh, and managed through negative selection and then optimized through the clonal selection process. And finally, the successful maneuvers are stored back into the database um, along with their relative position and velocity characteristics for future mappings. So when we look at maneuvers at its very basic level, how we are modeling it is in terms of a building block 
consisting of an autopilot mode, an autopilot target, and a duration for that, that execution of that mode. Um, you can see at the bottom, we can turn this into a genetic code, which is separated in terms of regions and weight regions, where, and the modes themselves, which we manipulate through, through uh, genetic algorithms, and also target and weight precision factors for higher resolution solutions, which we manipulate through evolutionary algorithms. This is just an example of some uh, basic building blocks corresponding to autopilots and their corresponding regions and time constants. In order to uh, model and predict uh, what's going to happen when we execute these, these um, basic building blocks, we need to be able to and assess them. We need to be able to, to model them in, in a fast time modeling um, implementation. And so each autopilot mode can basically be characterized by a rate limit and its time constant. And with that, we can minimize the number of modding, modeling points required to model the, each maneuver as, as it gets executed. Um, in terms of uh, a maneuver sequence, we can take each one of those building blocks and combine them um, in terms of a piecewise linear or piecewise constant command and the switching between these commands. And that forms the construction of the maneuver sequence, um, which, which in this case, uh, you know, one of the more, you know, we could do S turns, things like that. One of the more difficult ones would be something complicated like this. This is a half Cuban eight maneuver, but we wanted to show that we can construct a maneuver sequence using these building blocks to perform such a maneuver. And while we model it, um, since this is such a dynamic maneuver, one of the things that we can we can show is that for a lot of the slower portions of the maneuver, we can model with just a few points. And as we hit some um, rate limits, the, uh, these number of points will continue. So we can uh, try to optimize our modeling technique, trading off precision with speed, depending on the actual condition of what's being performed. So this is an example of some basic flight maneuvers uh, that a pilot may train to, of course, with corresponding targets and times and showing you that we can represent these in terms of genetic codes. Uh, during the immune response, um, we start off by initializing a maneuver database using training sets. Um, we generate an initial population through random selection of maneuvers and actually what we do is we use a normal distribution based on the strength of the problem solution mapping that is incorporated into that database. Uh, the population then goes through the cloning and maturation process and finally is placed back into the database as a learned solution. So that's the process. In terms of assessing the maneuver, we have a cost function that expresses rewards in terms of negative costs and penalties in terms of positive costs. And we break these down into categories. The largest category with the highest weights are to ensure the safety of the vehicle. Uh, medium category is to try to represent the, the objective. And in this case, we were looking at ACM, but it's whatever objective that we're trying to meet. And then the small category is to uh, help influence optimization process to reduce like the time of the maneuver, the complexity of the maneuver in terms of how many building blocks are going to be associated with it, et cetera. Um, so there's a lot of cost uh, function elements. This is just a, a picture of them so that you, you know, provide some detail. I think the slides are available. Uh, and then we finished off with some simulation uh, evaluations. And in this case, we use the model of a F-16. It's sort of an F-16. It's was actually released as a NASA control challenge problem years ago. That was our vehicle. Um, and one of the goals that we had is to see if we can generate a solution within one to two seconds. And so this can partially be manipulated by population size and diversity. Um, this is a, a plot of uh, iterations, in this case, 100 iterations and the corresponding performance index that we're trying to optimize. And the dashed line is like the negative selection cutoff um, portion, if you will. 
And by manipulating uh, how, where we make that cutoff, that's going to dictate uh, the diversity of the population. And at some point, you know, all of the, as we reintroduce new randoms, um, um, potential maneuvers into the population, as it starts converging to a solution, those those new those new uh, potential solutions will tend to get selected out by negative selection. And then we did so we did some uh, tests. This is an example of a uh, static test where we have a vehicle starting at zero, moving I think to the left, and we initialized our vehicle in different positions and different altitudes and ran the process so that we can get solutions to try to get behind the, the vehicle, the intruder vehicle. Um, we, and then we show both simulation and actual, uh, uh, predicted and actual simulation results. And these are the corresponding commands that were generated for those results. And we also looked at uh, lateral tests where we had the intruder perform like a flat scissor series of banks um, and in this dynamic test, we recomputed a new solution every five seconds. <clears throat> Keep in mind that some of the previous solutions were stored in memory or stored back into the database. So um, convergence tends to be faster. And then we also looked at some uh, dynamic tests that were coupled where the, the intruder performed like a rolling scissor. So that's what I have. Um, and I can answer questions if they're in. That was very interesting. Thank you for sharing. Um, while people are populating the, the chat or the uh, Q and A's, um, can this, do you think this could be used for uh, things other than airplanes or in um, other vehicles? So, so, so the, um, the artificial immune system approach, which, uh, incorporates the characteristics of the biologic immune system is definitely applicable. And the next question is how do you go through the process of constructing your, in our case, we're calling it immunized maneuver selection. And that's the, the implementation of, of the artificial immune system. So for us, we establish basic building blocks um, being autopilot modes and targets and durations and constructed higher order sequences. And as long as you can represent that in a genetic format, then you can expand that to different applications. Oh, very interesting. Cool. Um, and next up, uh, we have Nan Nguyen. OK, uh, uh, good afternoon, noon, everyone. Um, so uh, uh, Jay, go ahead and uh, go to the next slide. Uh, yeah, I'm going to ask you to move the slide for me. Okay, so um, so this is uh, uh, a technology that relates to green aviation um, that aims at uh, uh, reduced fuel burn. Um, and so we all know that uh, uh, um, aviation is, is really energy intensive. Um, it, it, it consumes a lot of fuel, and it also creates a carbon footprint. And the aircraft industry is continuing seeking out new solutions to reduce the carbon footprint as well as to decrease the fuel consumption. Um, you know, every year it burns over a billion uh, uh, barrels of fuel, right? So it's, it's a lot of, a lot of, a lot of uh, fossil fuel burn. Next slide. Uh, yeah, so... Um, so it turns out that nature provides a lot of energy optimal solution that we can learn from. You know, you look at birds, uh, you, know, bird is, uh, you know, birds are uh, really a, a bow in spy system that is really energy optimal. The way the birds are, the, are, are built, you know, like the wings, it ha has to be to change the shape of that wing to, to minimize drag. And it, it knows how to fly in formation so that it can also reduce the total energy consumption. So those are great ideas we can, that we can learn from. Next. So back in 2010, we, we were, we were kind of inspired, uh, uh, inspired by bird flight. So we, we, we started looking at how to come up with a, an aircraft design that can reduce the uh, fuel consumption. And so we, we came up with this idea that we could perhaps make the wing flexible or change the wing shape so that it can be more elastic rather than just a straight wing <clears throat> and see what happened to the drag 
<coughs> excuse me. And so we looked at some concepts, and the two concepts that we, we, we looked at, one this the so-called droop wing, and the other one is kind of inflected wing. And we ran some aerodynamic analysis, and we we found there's some about quite a bit of drag reduction, surprisingly. It's about, you know, I mean, 4 or 5%, I think. Um, I, I can't see from my slide, it's so, so small here, but yeah, it's about five, five, between four and five percent. So we was really um, intrigued, you know, and, and wanted to explore that further. Um, another idea that we also can, can, were exploring, next, next slide, please, is to, to mimic the ability to change the wing in flight. So it's like that, you know, bird fly with that, that bird wing so, so we came up with an, another idea called the variable camber continuous turning edge flap system. And <clears throat> so, so you look at that figure there, um, in the figure on the right. So, so this flap system is a multi-functional flap system. It has multiple span-wise uh, flap sections, and each section, each, each flap section has like three, three cord-wise elements. So all these cold white elements are designed to change the shape of the the, the, the pressure profile over the, 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 the wing. And then the span-wise flap sections are designed to tailor this, the lift distribution over the wing. Um, <clears throat> you know, from the aerodynamic theory, if we can maintain that elliptical lift distribution, we would maintain the minimum induced drag. So, so that allows the ability to change the shape of the wing to minimize drag, essentially. And this idea was kind of Got 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 Boeing interested. So Boeing actually came to us and talked with us quite a bit, and they actually ended up ended up getting some funding from NASA to help us work to work with us to further develop the technology. So you can see that they came up with some idea how to actuate the flap system uh, using shape memory alloy to um, to reduce the uh, the actuator weight, um, and they also proposed to use a conformal mold line material, which is gonna elastomeric material that fits right between the flap gaps so that the flap the flap has no gaps in between that would reduce all the viscous drag as well as reduce any 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 acoustic uh, signature um, so 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 anyway um, next please and if you could kind of play the video kind of, kind of illustrate uh, the animation of the of the variable cam with continuous trailing edge flap. That's how, how, how it works. So um, I think that's probably good enough, uh, Jay. Uh, you can move to the next slide. So so then we decide that we want to validate this technology. We want to see really it does buy us anything, whether the, the computational effort really pan out, whether we can see some drag reduction. That's the main goal, right? So we, we we had a we did a wind tunnel experiment in uh, in this in Kirsten wind tunnel, which is kind of low speed wind tunnel at University of Washington, and so we had that wind tunnel model built with the flap system, the variable camera controlling edge flap system. You can see that in the back there, in the background there, and we ran the experiment and we measured lift and drag and all the, the aerodynamic characteristics of, of the wind, and sure enough, we did see some. Drag reduction is quite a bit, actually. Actually, you know, this figure on the right uh, is the is one of the test the test points that we got from the the wind tunnel test, and it shows about six about six percent drag reduction, which is huge. You know, you know anything about aircraft industry? They are chasing after every single drag count, and one drag count is in less than one percent, right? And because fuel fuel burn is is important. That's that's you know, airline industry pays a lot for fuel bird, for fuel bill. Bill, I mean, so six of them send drag is is a huge amount of drag reduction. Anyway, so uh, next slide, please. And the other thing that we were also uh, working on uh, during that effort is is to explore the idea of doing a real time drag optimization. Uh, a lot of time we do drag optimization. Basically, we do it offline, and and aircraft company they do that. They they do drag optimization offline. They have a table lookup. They upload to FMS. They're gonna figure out how to fly that airplane that burns less less amount least amount of fuel. Um, but it's all offline based on model, and sometimes aircraft 
operation do change in flight. You know, they make cruises at, at a different altitude that, that, that's, uh, than intended, uh, or they may slow down the airplane or something like that. So the ability to be able to do the real-time drag enables us to figure out how to minimize the drag, the fuel consumption in real time, and that could bring that could could bring additional benefit to the aircraft industry or the airline industry to minimize fuel burn even in the in some um, uh, you know off normal condition or maybe n n unintended operation where you cruise at much lower altitude at a lower speed, whatever that is. So the real-time drag optimization strategy is not an idea that we were trying to do um, it, 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 in our work. And we also did a wind tunnel experiment to validate the technology to see if there's any drag benefit from, from this real-time drag optimization. So this is not a model base. This is all database. You drive, you collect data using sensor, and then from the sensor, you figure out how to optimize to get the drag. Um, so we did the wind tunnel test, and we got about 5% reduction uh, back, that's a 2018 test, also the custom wind tunnel. Uh, next, please. Okay, so you could uh, maybe play the, the, the two videos there. The, well, I guess one of them is kind of automatic to play, but yeah, so the video on the left shows, it was the first test entry when we did the, the validation work, and you can see the little those the, the flap when it's, when the wing deflects upward, you can see there's a lot of different uh, kind of white stripes. Those are the, the elastomeric material and the flap sections are down there. I mean, it's, it's all right right there. And the wing is really flexible because you know modern aircraft wings are flexible. And then the the video on the right, uh, I don't know, you can see it, but that's when we did the real time drag minimization experiment. So we have the actuators that are actually Active, so the wing has active, actively controlled actuators, and it just sample. It basically it do a system ID in real time by perturbing the flap, and it get the drag and lift, and it do a sensitivity calculation by numerical differentiation, and then use that to con conduct the drag optimization. Um, so those are the two wind tunnel experiments that we did uh, to validate this uh, variable camber continuous trailing flap technology, and I think that's the uh, brings this uh, 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 presentation to an end. Thank you. That was uh, very informative. Um, so uh, we have one question for this technology. How much weight do these systems add? Is it possible that the increases in weight for the complicated real-time drag optimization significantly reduce the drag reduction achieved? Well, I mean, I think that's a very good question. I've been asked that same question many, many times over, so I, I think I know the answer. So, of course, we do have to be careful, uh, uh, you know, uh, with, with the way we go about designing the flap system. We may, if we make too many flap uh, actuators, then we, we put more weight, and then it would offset all the benefits for drag reduction. So we have to do system analysis to figure out the minimum number of flap necessary to reduce the flap, to, to, I mean, to reduce drag without getting a, an offset in the, in, the, in the weight penalty, due to the weight penalty of the actuator. So we did do some analysis like that for a transonic thrust brace wing recently, where we actually modeled these, the system weight, the actuator weight, and it turns out that, yes, you have, we have, you, you know, we would have to limit number of flaps, and so for that transonic thrust brace wing, for example, we used about 12, 12 individual flaps, and we still get a net positive drag reduction of about like 1%, or 1 or 2%, actually, 2% at off, off, off nominal. Um, so, yeah. Thank you. Uh, and then um, we have one more question. Have you studied if there is a reduction in the strength of wake vortices? Wake vortices, well, that is not directly related to our research topic or research sub subject, but uh, we really have done much about that. But one thing to note is that we, we, this technology eliminates all the flap gaps. And one thing we know that the flap gaps generate a lot of 
wave vortices. When 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 the aircraft deploy flap, you can see the wake vortices shed off the corner of the flap, the flap, and it would, would propagate all the way back. Well, there's there will be no flap gaps here because all covered by this conformal mold line material. So there's no wake vortices shed off from the corner of the flap. The other thing is the acoustic. Uh, with the flap gaps completely covered, <clears throat> there won't be any noise, no acoustic, you know, noise generated from from the, the flow inside the, the flap gaps. Like you know, during landing when the aircraft deploy deploy flap, it makes a lot of noise. Very interesting. Um, and then one last question. Um, don't know if you're able to answer this or not, but there are several papers from European researchers showing drag polar invariance with flexibility. How does your approach uh, compare with those wind tunnel test data? The 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 answer is it confirms that that uh, that observation, the, the the drag polar doesn't 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 get affected a lot by the flexibility, but the actual drag and lift do change, because what happens when the wing becomes flexible, it it carries less a, a less lift because the relief of that 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 structural deflection causes the lift to reduce, but the drag pole itself remains fairly fairly the same as a wing with a with with a you know kind of like a very stiff wing. I would I would say, yeah. Got it. Um, and one last question before we move on to your next technology: How does this, how does this system handle turbulence, and how does this translate into passenger comfort? I, I uh, could you please repeat that question? I something just pop up and I just distract me. Could you please? Uh, yeah, uh, no worries. Um, uh, yeah. How does this system handle turbulence, and how does this translate into passenger comfort? Okay, well, when we talk about turbulence, I think I would defer that to the next uh, the next talk when we address turbulence and gust. So the answer is yes. We have account. We have addressed gust turbulence. You know, by active control, like uh, gust low alleviation control, and that is going to be the next the next presentation. Oh, perfect. Well, let's uh, move on to the next one. Great, thank you. <clears throat> All right. So, uh, so this technology <clears throat> is uh, is a multi-objective flight control um, optimization. Um, uh, so basically, it is kind of follow on and work. Uh, you know, related to that technology that I just described re previously. So next slide, please. So one thing that we know that the aircraft industry now is moving toward a new design, aircraft design uh, philosophy that embraces two main ideas. The first idea is, is using composite material. <clears throat> Basically, composite material is lightweight, but it can carry a lot of have high strength. So therefore, you can get higher uh, strength to weight ratio. And so, the, so and then the other the other um, design idea is basically making the wing a lot longer. We call it high aspect ratio wing. When you look at the Boeing 777X, which is the one that's going to be going to be out on the market in the next few years. That wing is a is a high aspect ratio wing. It basically it's so long that it can fit in the gate at the terminal. So the aircraft would have a a folding the mechanism that fold the wing tip up so that it would fit in the gate. So so the ultra high aspect ratio wing design is is a trend these days. And the reason for that is you get a lot of aerodynamic benefit from the ultra high uh, aspect ratio wing design, but like in anything else, there's there's no free lunch. You're gonna pay something, and what are you what you paying with to with the is is that you're gonna start losing some capability, or you may your your the aircraft operation may be less uh, it may be more susceptible to a lot of issues. For example, it could be uh, the, the as the wing become longer, structural loading gonna go up. So any Maneuver low and gust low would would create um, some additional load, loading on the wing. The other thing is increased drag. Yeah, the longer the wing, you think you get a a uh, 
we get a better uh, LVD, well, it only works at the design point, but at off design point, and if the wind deflects due to elasticity, you, you start losing um, um, uh, uh, drag. It turns out my power, my power just come on, so I make a lot of noise here, sorry about that. Um, uh, and then the other thing is also the stability. I mean, the aircraft flight stability could be compromised if the wind becomes so flimsy or so long. So you have to worry about how to control the aircraft to make sure that it performs safely and efficiently. Next slide. So this idea of multi-objective flight control uh, comes about as the need for for being able to address all of those competing objectives that I mentioned uh, uh, arise. Like how do we address drag, uh, you know, drag reduction? How do we address structural loading? And how do we address stability all at the same time? And in a traditional aircraft design, you have only one control authority per axis. You, in other words, you can only control uh, like pitch with the elevator, roll with the aileron, and yaw with the rudder. That's all you could do because you got you got you don't have any redundancy. <clears throat> but let's say we have the future aircraft could have a lot of redundant flight control surfaces, like the VCCPF, uh, for example. You know, and Boeing's already looking at you know having redundant flight control surfaces. We call it distributed flight control surfaces. So the moment you have more flight control surfaces. Then you have the additional design freedom to be able to optimize your flight control system to do all the objectives that you normally would not be able to do because you don't have enough control authority. Now you now you do. So so one of so so there are multiple objectives that we want to address. Uh, we want to be able to minimize drag um, in real time and in, in as we as an aircraft uh, do does any maneuver or cruise. We want to be able to suppress any structural mode because all the wings have become flexible. The structural mode is going to creep into the flight control bandwidth, and we have to suppress them. Um, otherwise, it's going to mess up the, 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 the so-called pilot handling quality. Um, we want to be able to improve the ride quality. That is how the passengers feel when they sit, when they sit in the cabin. And no, no one likes to feel a bump, want to experience bumpy flight. Bumpy flight is very un uncomfortable. We want that flight to be really smooth. And then we also want to reduce the structural load, load alleviation. So the, the, the multi-objective flight control technology would address those objectives all simultaneously by leveraging the ability to do multi-objective flight controls, I mean, multi-functional flight control system with, with uh, distributed flight control surfaces like the, the variable camera continuous trailing as flap. And this figure on the, la on the left shows um, we, we basically kind of, um, did some study for trying to find some trust space for wing when we apply this, this, this um, control surface type concept on, on the transfer trust space wing. Uh, next, please. So this is kind of like the math, but uh, I'm just going to try to hit the, the, the high point. So when we talk about a flight control, we really talk about optimization. Control is, is really about optimization. You want to optimize to minimize something. You want to minimize the, the error between the, signal, the, the sensors and what, where you, and what you want to do. You want to mis minimize the energy consumption, and et cetera. So, so we need to use a cost function, and we want to be able to in, incorporate multiple competing objectives in this cost function. Uh, the traditional cost function for an any aircraft flight control is to be able to track the pilot command. We want to be able the pilot to, to go exactly where he wants he or she wants to go by applying the stick input. We want to minimize the power expenditure due to actuator motion, uh, but we also now want to add in the, the other control objectives that we normally would not be able to do with the conventional aircraft design. And for example, we want to be able to minimize or suppress the acceleration signal. And that is important because that would improve the ride quality for the passenger comfort. And then we also want to minimize the structural load or 
load alleviation control and because the aircraft usually encounter gusts all the time and when it bangs or do any kind of high G maneuver, it would experience excessive loading. So we want to be able to alleviate any structural loading experience on the aircraft structure. And then drag, which is important because that's, uh, that's a performance uh, um, metric to, you know, fuel burn and all the stuff is important. And so we kind of synthesize all these objectives together in this optimal control framework and we obtain some of the control design and control gain through the so-called linear quadratic uh, regulator design. And if we have sensor, then we have to use some sort of like state estimation like by a common future to reconstruct the state information. And so, so this is how what we're trying to do uh, with, with this multi-objective flight control. Uh, next, next please. <clears throat> and this is kind of like a sensor strategy. So we think about, okay, so where do we put a sensor to get sufficient information to do the control jobs, you know? So we, if we look at like uh, right quality uh, improvement objective, then we need to pick up some accelerometer measurement at the aircraft CG, maybe at the aft, need, need a tail, uh, because the passengers sitting near the aft, uh, sit in the aft cabin would feel a much different G loading than the one sitting near the wing. Um, so we need to set some sensors, so accelerometer sensor to pick up the acceleration. We also have to suppress the structural mode, so we need to pick up some, some accelerometer on the wing, on the wing itself. And then if we want to minimize structure, structural loading, then we need to get some strain gauge signal, a strain gauge sensor um, to, to, to measure the, the wing root bending moment or something like that. Um, next slide. And so this is a, a couple uh, simulation uh, that we did for a, for, for, for a NASA generic transport model, which is like a Boeing 757. Uh, and so we did this in a simulation where we did a, a fly, a fly uh, through turbulence. So we apply some turbulence, uh, just a normal um, uh, atmospheric turbulence, uh, and then we try to deploy the draft minimization control. Um, and you can see the figure on the left show the draft, the draft um, uh, for, the, for the aircraft uh, with, with, with and without the multi-objective flight control system. And you can see that when you, if we turn on the draft minimization, oh, could you go back to the next slide, please? I mean, to be the slide. Yeah, when we turn on the, the draft uh, controller, then we can, you can see definitely there's a drag reduction quite a bit there. I feel like feel like like almost you know almost 20 counts, which is quite quite significant. Um, <clears throat> and then the figure on the right <clears throat> is the uh, is a, a simulation result for gust low elevation. Excuse me. <clears throat> so here we basically uh, apply some some gust low. Uh, we, we we, we simulate the aircraft fly with, with, with gust input and just a turbulence uh, um, from the turbulence. And then we um, run the simulation without the gust, gust low alleviation and then with the gust low alleviation. And we can see that the, effective, the, the effectiveness of the gust low alleviation, it may be basically it knocks down all the, is knocked down the, the wing root bending moment quite, quite substantially. Um, so, so we know it's, it's fairly effective. Um, and then next slide, please. <clears throat> so this this is about the right quality, and the right quality is, is is important because it it is how passenger feels. And an airplane company like to be able to sell aircraft that that behaves well in flight, and passenger would like to fly on those things. So the Boeing seven A seven. Is a high aspect ratio wing. It also has a lot of flexibility. The wing has a lot of flexibility, and and they have to do some special flight control design in you know, order to suppress the flexing of that wing, so that the passenger feel do not feel the G loading due to that wing flexes. So they have some technology that actually enable the, the, the enable the right quality to be substantially improved. They call it like right right. Smooth ride technology, I think that's what they call it, Boeing call it. 
So here we we apply this this uh, acceleration acceleration the acceleration suppression feature of the multi objective flight control. So we turn on the uh, the acceleration suppression controller, and then we also blend it in with some of the gust load elevation, and then the flight path um, angle um, command, and just to see how we can how 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 well it does in terms of so to be being able to provide improved hand ride quality. So the figure on the top two figures illustrate the G loading at the at the aircraft CG during a very excessive high turbulent flight condition. So you can see that the the the, the G the, the the vertical acceleration in the cabin is pretty high. It's like almost 2G and a negative 2.5G. So this fly is very bumpy, very bad. And then when we turn on the acceleration suppression, well, the G, the, the vertical acceleration is greatly reduced. It's less than 1G. Um, so it, it, it works really well. And then we did some right quality assessments. So we have some right quality metrics to, to measure, the, to, to estimate how passenger would feel. And we plot on that bar, the bar chart there. You can see those six uh, bars corresponding to six different controllers. Those controllers are identified in that table on the left. And the one that works really well is the number four controller. And that happened to be the one that with the acceleration controller on. Um, so so that's, that's, that's the end of this uh, presentation. Thank you. Um, I can take some questions to answer some questions. Yeah. So uh, the question um, from before has been answered through your presentation. So thank you for that. And so a new question came up. Uh, this system also has to be optimized under all conditions of multiple actuator failures. Is there a chance of overstressing harmonics developing when some fail and others continue to respond? Well, I mean, we 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 haven't addressed the you know like actuator failures or anything like that. Uh, it's uh, but it is something that we 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 are mindful um, that we would have to address that if we're going to start if we want if we want to mature the technology because we have if you want to certify anything, that's one of the conditions you have to deal with. And but we we do that we we have done work on uh, on you know adapt adaptive control to address. Uh, you know, actuator failures or some contingency issue that may come up, but we just haven't done this for this, for having done that work under this program. But yeah, but we 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 are aware that that's something that we need to to to, to deal with. Sounds good. Um, and I think that's it for now. Maybe some will trickle in while you talk about uh, your next technology. All right. Good. All right, so this is the uh, another technology. It's also it's called elastic wing shipping, uh, but I think that it's like it's a truncated title because there's, there's something missing. And it's probably more relevant. Um, you could move to the next slide, please. All right, so uh, let's talk about distributed electric propulsion aircraft. So we know that uh, electric aircraft is something that that is on the horizon of many many aircraft companies nowadays because of the, the emphasis on green aviation. So aircraft industry is looking at electrifying aircraft fleet. How to make the airplane fly without burning fossil fuel or burning less foss fossil fuel. But one way to do it is to use batteries. And now when you put you have batteries on board, well it's gonna change the whole entire aircraft design altogether because you no longer use the gas turbine engine to power the airplane, but you might have to use electric propulsors to power the airplane because, because those electric propulsors are smaller in size and they can, they can, they can be better driven by electric, electric motor as opposed to be gas turbine engine. So instead of having two big gas turbine engine, we would have multiple little Propulsors placed along the wing, so we call it distributed electric propulsion. And the NASA X-57 aircraft Maxwell 
is an example of the distributed electric el propulsion aircraft. All right. And so the figure on the right is, an, is, a, is a, kind of like a system study and that we did. Uh, we did it on a NASA genetic transport, um, which is really a B757 derivative. We just don't want to call it that at that because Boeing gonna get mad at us. <laughs> um, but you look at the, the conventional the conventional gas turbine engine for the Boeing 757. I think it's like a Pratt Whitney 4200 series. The 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 dry weight for that engine is about 12,000 pounds. Okay. So now if we're gonna remove that gas turbine engine, we're gonna replace the gas gas turbine engine with electric propulsors. And let's say we do a hybrid configuration where we actually still have a a power generating unit, we call it turbo generator. So we got a turbo generator, which is still a, a fossil fuel burning uh, gas turbine engine, but it's going to be smaller because it's only going to generate electricity to power the, the electric propulsors. So we got a, a generator that maybe weigh about 5,600 pounds, and they got uh, those little propulsors, and they, they may be um, uh, about 2,000 pounds each. And then let's say we have four, you know, eight of these, these I mean, uh, eight of these propulsors or four per wing, so that's that's 8,000 pounds plus another 5,000 pounds for a triple generator. It may come up to be like about 13,000 13, pounds. So it's maybe a little bit, little bit uh, heavier than maybe a, the gas turbine engine. But at least it would be cleaner because now there's less fuel, fossil fuel burn, right? Okay, next please. So, so the idea here is that well, we could do something about the the street electric propulsion. We could leverage the 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 wing flexibility to get some performance benefit from distributed electric propulsion. And the way we want to do that is that we want to be able to use the thrust produced by these propulsors to twist the wing. Okay, so if we can twist the wing, then we can actually change the aerodynamics of that on that wing. And if we can change aerodynamics on that wing, we can reduce drag. So that's the idea here. So the idea here is basically, we want to be able to change the wing twist by using the, 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 the propulsive thrust. So when the, when the propulsor produces thrust, it also generate a twisting moment on the wing because it's mount, mounted under the wing. And we assume that the propulsor are, mount, are wing mounted, they're not like, Mounted to the back or anything like that, and by 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 being able to twist the wing, we can affect the aerodynamics on that wing, and then we can get some potential drag drag benefit out of that. So that's the idea. Um, next slide, please. So so basically, the thrust produced by the propulsors could generate lift for us, um, and if 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 we make the wing more flexible, then we can actually twist that wing, and we, by twisting by being able to twist that wing, we can make the wing to pitch up. And when it pitches up, it create creates a an angle of attack, and that angle of attack is going to generate additional lift for us. And so we can actually tailor the lift the, the the amount of lift by changing the stiffness of the wing. So we make the wing more 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 flexible or less stiff, then we can potentially get get more lift out of that wing. So we did some, um, so we 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 did uh, a simulation here where we actually changed the the torsional stiffness and the bending stiffness of the wing structure, and we kind of look at how many how much how much additional lift we can generate for this for this NASA genetic transport model, and you can see that we could get up, up to about uh, well this figure about uh, 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 fifteen thousand. I mean, uh, yeah, with a hundred, yeah, fifteen thousand pounds extra in lift, and it's also interesting to know that it's uh, the way we 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 apply the thrust can also change the way we can, we can get lift. You know, was the we can get more lift, for example, by increasing thrust toward the wing tip, which makes sense because if you make the thrust to be more concentrated at the wing tip. Then the wing 
the wing is less is more flexible at the tip than at the root, so it can be easily twisted at the tip than at the root. So if you can twist the wing at the, the tip, then you can actually generate more lift. That's why it, it, you get more lift by, by increasing thrust toward the tip. Um, but by increasing lift doesn't mean that you're going to get better drag because lift and drag are two different things. So, so we're going to talk about drag in the next slide. So next slide, please. So, so the ability to change the, sh the distribution, the, the, the span-wide load or the span-wise lift distribution on the wing directly affects the, the, the induced, drag, in, induced drag on the aircraft. And most airplane designers want the aircraft to fly more or less as an elliptical lift distribution at cruise so that it would get the maximum LVD or because that's where the, the induced drag is at the minimum. So we want to be able to shift that lift distribution to be more or less elliptical, basically. And if the, so we, so we, we did a, a, an aerodynamic analysis with this distributed proportion uh, idea. So that we, got, we, got, we consider a stiff wing and a flexible wing. A stiff wing is the kind of Boeing, the, the traditional conventional wing that has very has a lot of stiffness. It has very, it, does, it doesn't twist a lot. So that's that is that is the the, the, the plot on the left. It shows that uh, the wing is really very stiff. So we try to plot, we try to figure out how much lift generated by the by the thrust uh, by the propulsive thrust. It doesn't change a whole lot. You can see fairly it more or less it, it follows the same pattern, same lift, lift distribution as. A, a conventional wing without any distributed proportion. But the figure on the right, uh, where we actually apply to a more flexible wing, so we change, we, we, we make the wing stiffness to go down. And now we can see that the thrust, the, 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 the thrust can actually affect the, the, lift, the span wide lift distribution quite, quite substantially. You know, in particular, you can look at some of the, the thrust variation, and if you concentrate the thrust toward the inboard, you get a a fairly, you know, uh, similar pro, uh, span wise lift distribution as an ellipt elliptical lift distribution. But if you move the, the thrust variation toward outboard, then you get some, kind of more like a flat um, lift distribution, which is terrible for for drag. So, so drag does the opposite. You want to concentrate thrust toward the inboard rather than the outboard because you get a more favorable lift distribution that would give you minimum induced drag. Next, please. And so, when then we did a, we did a system analysis. We do a range analysis. You know, take try and look at how much how much how much uh, improvement in the cruise range. For a given, given fixed amount of fuel, we can get using this uh, elastic sh wing shipping control using distributed, distributed electric propulsion, and so we ran different. Uh, um, we we ran we ran this analysis for different uh, um, configuration. You know, we use a, a single generator configuration, the dual generator, with we have two generators per wing. Uh, you know, and, and and then we look at different thrust variation, move, making the thrust uniform, concentrate the thrust toward the inboard, or concentrate the thrust toward the outboard, and see what happens. And you can see that the the figure that show the 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 positive net gain in the cruise range performance is due to a uniform thrust. We can get to almost less than one percent, but if if you could you go with a, like a fifty percent Thrust inboard and then minus 50% thrust outboard, um, you could get up to about 2% drag reduction. I mean, uh, cruise range improvement. 2% improvement in, in the cruise range translates to 2% improvement in drag, in the fuel burn, basically. I mean, reduction in, in the fuel burn uh, if you keep the range fixed. So, so, so yeah, so we, we did see a, 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 a benefit. Um, in terms of uh, range performance and fuel burn reduction using this idea of an electric, this um, elastic wing shipping control 
with electric propulsion, or uh, distributed electric propulsion. And next, please. And the other thing that we also are considering or, or, or is the is the fly propulsion control aspect. So we have a lot of these control these uh, propulsors that generate thrust, and they can ver generate thrust by varying am amount. So therefore, we can also use the propulsor to generate to do a yaw control instead of uh, the traditional lift uh, the rudder rudder control. Um, and that could minimize the tail size. We can change, we can reduce the tail size. That could save some weight. But another thing that we want, uh, with we 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 are considering, uh, we can that, that would be the benefit uh, from the from this uh, air elastic wing shipping control uh, is that uh, it it creates this so-called provost yaw, and what what that means is that it creates a yaw yawing moment. In favor, in in a favorable in a favorable uh, direction during a roll maneuver. So typically, a conventional aircraft when when it rolls, it generates an opposing yaw, yawing moment, which we call it adverse yaw. It, it, so that means that the the rudder has to do some extra work to move to 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 yaw the airplane into the roll, uh, into the turn, and and that means that. The rudder has to produce more control power than 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 it would typically um, when it doesn't do any any rolling. Well, with this uh, uh, flight proportion control, when we roll, it creates the provost yaw. So that means that it 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 yaw in the right direction. So therefore, the rudder does less work. So. And that's one additional benefit from from the drag reduction or, or, or the the cruise range with improvement, you know, um, with this technology. So I think this is where I'm going to end. Thank you. Yeah, uh, this is great. And let's see if um, yeah, we have one question. Uh, have you found that flutter speed is sensitive to increased wing flexibility? <laughs> Yeah, I know that question will come up. <laughs> uh, well, it we did actually do a flutter analysis with the with the with the distribute with the distribute proportion. So we actually account for the masses of the of the proposal along the wing, and we account for the reduced stiffness of the wing. We we kind of thought that yeah, our flutter speed gonna drop, and then we we, not, we may not meet the flutter clearance requirement by FAA, um, but. Uh, it was surprising that we did not see that. So it was, but 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 that's just one particular configuration that we study. I'm not saying that's all we apply to every configuration with distributed distribu distribu proportion. So yes, I think the answer is that we can judiciously place the proposers in such a way to that we could we would not. Uh, impact the flutter the flutter speeds significantly. Thank you. Um, we got another question. At what point is a reduction of wing torsional and bending stiffness um, does aeroelastic instability become a limiting factor? Well I mean it's, it's completely depend on the aircraft design, but that's I'm gonna to wanna to give a so I, I talked to my Boeing commercial airplane colleague and he worked on the Boeing 7A7. So he told me that the Boeing 7A7 wing stiffness is about half of what the original, I mean, the, the kind of like a conventional metal wing. Okay, the Boeing 7A7 is an all composite wing. So he said that the composite wing has less stiffness than the al aluminum wing by about half. I think he mentioned that was in the bending, bending stiffness was, was Quite lower, but the torsional stiffness is probably almost the same. He said that. Uh, to the question, so the answer is, I think the aircraft industry is already flying airplane with lower stiffness wing. You look at the Boeing 787; is really flexible wing. I mean, I you know I sat out the wing out the out the window and I could see the wing tip move up quite a bit. Yeah. So so, but of course we we, we can only reduce the stiffness up to a point before we're gonna run into Air elastic instability and also air elastic issue. So we don't want to do it too much either. 
Thank you. Yeah, that was great. Um, and I think that was the last question. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Nan. That was all extremely informative. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for you know, bearing with me with the all this issue with my power loss. <laughs> No, no, it totally, it totally happens. You know, the age of uh, webinars um, and work from home. So I totally get that. But thank you for uh, being yeah. able to hop on. I appreciate it. All right. Thank you. Um, and next up, we have Joseph, uh, and he'll be talking about his Cobra technology. Okay. Thanks, Jay. Um, so I will be going over our technology we call Cobra. Uh, which we define as a mission optimization process by which an entry system is co-optimized along with its trajectory, TPS structures and subsystems to satisfy a set of stakeholder objectives and constraints. And I'd like to also acknowledge my co-inventors, James Brown, David Kinney, Def Bowles, and Najee Mansour. Uh, next slide. So a key motivation for the development of this process was what I call the ESAS experience. And in 2005, as the shuttle was being planned for retirement, NASA commissioned a 90-day study to explore entry vehicle concepts that would have replaced the space shuttle and specifically avoid impact during launch. And the first things that were, were being proposed were heritage-based uh, capsule concepts um, However, headquarters wanted us to look at something that was had a little bit more performance. And because of this, a team was formed to explore this, which led to experts providing various their, their, their ideas as far as other concepts that could be explored. <clears throat> and what we found is as we evaluate some of these ideas, uh, there was some stability issues that even though they perform better in certain uh, areas, they had some other uh, deficiencies. And they, so we started locally at Ames looking at a parametric capsule, asymmetric capsule vehicle, which we did parametric studies. And we came up with a, a concept that performed well, as well as avoided some of the stability issues. And then we proposed this <clears throat> to the stakeholders at JSC but at the time, um, we only had limited um, analysis to show the benefits. And even though there was a, a good portion at JSU that would wanted to carry this technology forward, the, the ultimate decision was to uh, go back with something like Apollo like, and that's what we now know as the Orion vehicle. <clears throat> Through this experience, we, we we also realized that in order to do a really good uh, um, under, uh, investigation into a new concept, we needed to evaluate all the disciplines associated with that vehicle. And we saw that the shape really drove everything. So what we wanted to do um, is something where we would integrate all these uh, disciplines. And unlike what we were doing at the time is there was various uh, agents uh, within the agency centers that were in charge of different disciplines. So what we did is we, if you go to the next slide, <clears throat> we basically came up with uh, this process that basically has three parts. You have the shape optimization, which basically drives the shape. I mean, the vehicle concept and all these disciplines. And then we also realized that we had to evaluate all the ideas using a uh, vehicle closure that uh, actually looks at the vehicle's trajectory structures, TPS, and the vehicle subsystems. So what, what we did is that we, we came up with a way to generate in different class of shapes. And one of the ones that we started focusing on is a middle over D concept, which we call also Cobra. And it's a parametric shape for that because the, the next big push was for NASA to look at entry systems for Mars. And so the, the, what we did is we started with that and we applied a generic algorithm to explore various uh, shapes, uh, parameter, well, using the genetic algorithm, evaluating with engineering tools early on, and then starting to evaluate the whole system closure and stacking those against the point of departure which is the unoptimized vehicle. 
And what we could do now is go to stakeholders and show them a whole analysis of not only the uh, baseline shape, but also the optimized shape and let them uh, weigh in as well as other experts as to what they felt were pros and cons, because on that cradle set, all those are optimum. We just need to choose one to explore. And by doing that, we were able to get further and actually get buy-in from a lot more of the stakeholders. So if we can go to the next slide. So here I'm just highlighting the uh, different applications that we've applied this process to, as well as some what I call realizations. Um, again, as I mentioned, the Mars uh, concept, which is a middle or D concept, it turns out that for NASA, the Mars, uh, there's two concepts in, in consideration. One of them is based on this process, uh, which we call the Cobra MRV. And then also we applied this to Mars 2018 when early on they were trying to look for an alternate vehicle shape. However, that didn't get uh, selected, but we also uh, applied it to other concepts for Venus. And then real, more real, realistically, what we are applying it is uh, exploring how we could evaluate these uh, both in wind tunnel tests, <clears throat> ballistic range testing we've done on one of our concepts, and more recently in 2020, we did some um, control surface effectiveness studies, evaluations in the wind tunnels to verify some of the predictions that we had made. Um, and so that goes to the next slide, last slide, I think. No, one more slide, yeah. So basically in conclusion or in summary, the, uh, the benefits of this process provides an efficient automated a way of de exploring design shapes and with a small number of shape parameters. And then we looked at what we call co-optimization was we, you, you don't just optimize one thing, you try to explore the, the entire mission and see what how they all stack up all the different performance requirements to make some set of uh, mission objectives uh, and constraints. And then also because we're integrating all this within a uh, server, we can save all our files. So we are building in automatically a configuration management so that we can always go back to a given design and re-implement uh, our whole process to evaluate it, uh, whether we wanted to uh, explore something that we did in the past or we wanted to uh, go back and study it some more. So that's kind of the entire summary. And there's one last slide that just kind of highlights the whole thing in a nutshell. So if you have any questions, I can take those. Yeah, great, thank you. That was very, um, very informative. Uh, so we have uh, one question. Um, do you use the free molecular flow and bridging function method methodology for rarefied flows within CBRO as part of this process, if you can answer that? So we don't at we haven't used that, but it's an option. It's not been one that we've been uh, concerned with when we were designing the Mars missions. Awesome. Um, yeah, I think that was the only question we had. Um, so I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Joseph. Hey, you're welcome. Well, thank you everyone for tuning in, and this was a great webinar, and hopefully. Uh, We'll see some of your applications uh, for these technologies.